<laughs> All right. Thank you so much for coming. On behalf of MSU Denver, the College of Business, Department of Management, and the Center for Entrepreneurship, welcome to Women Entrepreneurs Week. My name is Becky Prater, and I'll be your host. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, today, we are super fortunate to have with us one of my really good friends, Ginger Grinkmeyer. So I'm going to tell you and do an intro, and then I'm going to tell you how we know each other, because that's a really interesting story. Okay, so Ginger is a working artist with a thriving community of followers. She started with a picture frame, with picture frame designs, and worked with an importer to begin with. It grew quickly into a retail business with a shop and studio in Florida, and then expanded into a wholesale gift art design and production and supply studio. So the key here is this wholesale gift art designs. So we're going to go into that more specifically in a second, because that's very unusual. So Ginger is a multimedia artist working with various acrylic mediums, watercolors, ink, fabric, resin, paper, pastels, and occasional cool things she finds lying around. Most importantly, Ginger embeds in every piece, soul and intention, meaning and symbolism, texture and balance to move people, inspire them, and remind them of this beautiful world and the love that surrounds us. So the very coolest thing about Ginger is that she and I met each other, I like, oh my God, like 26 years ago or something, 25 yeah. years ago. Um, I was working at, in a snowboard clothing company and I was managing our riders, you know, our team. And Ginger was one of our professional snowboard borders or whatever, however you'd say it. And so we traveled around together a bit and had so much fun in that industry. And then we both had kids and life changed and we got serious and settled down. And here we are different than that, <laughs> but still with a sense of, of um, kind of seeing the world differently than other people. So I appreciate you so much for all that. Okay. So I would like you to tell us about your business kind of how you got into it. Like, what was your transition from snow professional snowboarder to artist? Did you study it? Did you fall into it? Tell us all about that and kind of what inspired you to start. Okay. Well, so when we were living out in Colorado and I was snowboarding and would have like 140 days on the hill for a couple of years in a row. And that was really fun. A lot. It was just a ton of fun, ton and tons and tons of fun. But at a certain point, I realized partly because of my age, probably, and also partly because at the time there were no, like, so few professional women who were snowboarding. And like, we literally knew like two or three various women's names were known compared to the number of guys. And so basically what it led to was I wasn't receiving enough out of it. I was receiving joy because it was so fun, but I knew that it wasn't um, a career option for me. Like it wasn't the time for boys. And, um, and even that it was so still like minimally monetized that I wanted to go back to school. So we moved back down to Boulder and I actually um, uh, graduated from University of Colorado with a degree in kinesiology and applied physiology, which has absolutely nothing to do with art. <laughs> um, however, in my experience over the years, what I've learned is there is a direct relationship between people who are in the medical field and art being artistic and creative a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times. I think, I think it's just being a detailed person. So um, anyway, I've figured that out along that way, along the way with conversations, but um, we left Colorado and we moved to Birmingham, Alabama from my husband with his business. And I decided to forego medical school and uh, we started, we had our oldest daughter and um, I was bored while she would nap. And, and I had already started designing um, and making stationery, whether it be for like, we, I even helped uh, make our wedding invitations years before that and uh, always make our Christmas cards and various holiday cards, but hadn't sold anything yet. And then when we lived in Birmingham, I actually started selling my stationery. And um, one thing led to the next that I actually incorporated. So I became an LLC with stationery company. And then um, I was actually published also, I would submit art designs like stationary designs and were, was published in several different art magazines with my stationery. And the thing about stationery was the way that it was laid out it was very graphic for me. And so then I needed to give people Christmas gifts. And I took those same concepts from my stationary designs and turned them into picture frames. 
And so um, I would just give those picture frames. But then an importer found out about my picture frames and asked me to submit uh, some designs. And so I submitted uh, 20, 22 designs and uh, we took all but one of them to market, which is like a, a wholesale market. And they basically take orders for a week and then they send it all off at, the, at that time to China, get it made. I would have to submit, um, I mean, I would have to approve their samples. They would get it all made, they would bring it back and they would distribute it. So it was all in royalties for me, which was an interesting concept because I'd never done that before. And um, royalties are, um, like I said, it's very interesting. And it's something you kind of, it's kind of a, like a hard thing to swallow as an artist that somebody's going to tell you're only going to get 7% of your um, sales. And that's actually really high. A lot of times royalties, if it's a huge, oh yeah, if it's a huge company, they, you might only get 3% off the sales, but they were pretty blown away because that first time that we went to market, they sold a hundred thousand dollars worth of my picture frames and there were 20 designs. And so I didn't know, I had nothing to measure that off of, but I was like a hundred thousand dollars. Holy cow. That's a lot of money. And my $7,000 that I got to keep for myself <laughs> at the time was still like, that was a lot of money for me. Cause it was like the first huge amount of money that I ever gotten from my artwork. And, um, and what I realized was with royalties is it's hard to accept that you're only going to get 7%, but what's really great is I could have never sold all that product. I could have never made all that product. I didn't want to be the importer and deal with all the like containers sitting in customs for months and molding and stuff like that. You hear horror stories about that stuff. And so the $7,000, what it did was it just kind of every month I would get a paycheck from them and it started out big and then it would, you know, depreciate until the next time they would go to market. And then I would get another big check and they would... So it was kind of, it was kind of nice. And eventually what happened was they trusted me as a designer and they um, would submit my designs even like Cracker Barrel. So I had like ceramic coffee mugs and Cracker Barrel and you'd flip it over and it would say the name of the company, but then it would say by Ginger Lee Designs, which my company name is actually Ginger Lee, L-E-I-G-H Designs. And so Grinkmeyer is actually my married name. Um, but anyway, so what happened was uh, I was between seasons, um, I would get bored. And so I'd start designing originals and people would find out about that and want to buy them directly from me. And uh, that's kind of how it, that's kind of how it evolved into what it is, uh, what it is today that we, um, we, I don't know if you want me to tell you about like how I started with my retail shop or. I do, you know, first though, I do want to say I was in, I remember being in Savannah, Georgia and seeing your picture frame because you used your own girls as the picture. And I yeah. remember thinking, oh my God, this is ginger stuff. And oh, I yeah. texted you, I took a picture and I was so excited. Yeah. There's nothing quite like that, you know? I still get, I still, like, I think the most recent was like up to a year ago, someone sent me a picture of my daughter in a picture frame because there were a couple of pictures that were so great of my kids that the company I designed for just kept using their pictures. I didn't mind because we became friends. It wasn't a big deal. And so, but yeah, we were as far as like six miles from the Canadian border in Idaho one time. And there was a picture of my kids in one of my picture frames. Whoa. oh yeah that's after this the first summer that my picture frames were released my kids went back to school and all of their friends thought that they had become instantaneous models it was fun it's very fun that is exhilarating that's so cool okay so now how did you transition then from doing that because you're still doing wholesale but that is a different kind of what would you say is that Okay, so that's kind of a licensing situation and then you became a wholesaler yourself? Yes, so um, so what happened was I uh, we moved to Florida and I needed a studio space and I knew that I could count on having some income because of my licensing. And so when I rented the studio space, I decided that I would partition some of it off as retail, but the other part would be studio because I knew at least half of it in the month would be covered by this licensing. So I was like, well, I need to generate the other half and so I'm gonna do it with retail. And I was a nervous wreck about doing it because we had that oil spill. It was actually the fall after the oil spill that happened, I think in the spring, late spring. And so the economy down here and tourism down here just went big time south. And so, so I was like, oh my gosh, I must be crazy. I'm opening a retail shop and there's like not near the traffic. But again, I had nothing to gauge off of because we had just moved here. 
And so, but I was a nervous wreck about it. And I basically needed to get a thousand dollars a month covered with my retail sales. And all that I had in my shop was my stuff. And I also collected a lot of antiques and like ephemera and architectural salvage because I would incorporate it into my art. So anything that I could get in bulk, I would sell half of it and keep half of it. But that's all that I had for inventory. Well, I was a nervous wreck about it. And I happened to be in my shop. Like I wasn't even really open yet. This family came in and bought $700 worth of art. And I was just like, oh my gosh, this is insane. Like I was more impressed with that $700 than that initial $7,000 check that I got. I was so excited because I'm like, I can do this. I can do this. And so, so yeah, I started with that retail shop and had, um, part of it as my studio and part of it retail, which worked out beautifully. I highly recommend it to anyone who wants to start out with their own creative business, whatever it may be, if you can combine, because people really want to see what you're doing. They want to see who made it. They want to have a relationship. They want to have a connection. And it was hard for me to talk about that stuff because I didn't want to sound like I was being all, you know, full of myself and everything, but people really want to know. And, and, you know, it, when I snowboarded professionally, people would say, oh, you must be pretty good. Like not seeing me on the hill, but seeing me later on, like out, out and about. And they'd be like, oh, you must be pretty good if you're a professional. And I kind of never owned it so much. I would all, my response, because I didn't want to seem too cocky or arrogant. So my response would always be, yeah, I can hold my own. But what I realized with my art was that when I would say that to people, they would almost seem like deflated. It was like a, rah, rah, rah. they were so excited to meet this person who did it. And all of a sudden, I'm just like, yeah, I can, you know, I'm back, yeah. And they're just like, ugh. <laughs> and so what I realized was I, was I would have, I had to change my response and I had to own it and I had to be proud of it and be comfortable with the fact that I was doing that. And um, anyway, what happened was I, um, I went to, I was invited to go to a country living fair, which now is huge. Back then it was big, but now it's huge. So I went to a country living fair in Atlanta. And while I was there, I was uh, like two or three different people gave me business cards about Atlanta, America's Mart in Atlanta. And I'm like, I have no idea what this is, but somebody just invited me to something, which is so cool. I don't even know I was invited to, but it's cool. <laughs> and so, so I hemmed and hawed, and this was in October. The show was in October. I hemmed and hawed the entire time through November the first half of December and this one woman kept reaching out to me from America's Mart. And I finally was just like, you know what? Fine. I'll come. Well, so she, the only booth that they had available was in this back corner on the back side of the bathroom cubicle thing. It was three feet deep and 20 feet wide. And I could go as high as eight feet tall. And Again, I had nothing to gauge off of if this was good or not. I had already been doing festivals, so I knew how I set my stuff up, but I didn't know. Um, is everything okay? Yeah, there was just okay. some weird glitch. Okay. okay, go ahead. So, um, so I didn't know. I I didn't know what I was going to do with this flat, long wall. I was just really confused by it. And um, you actually years ago told me when you were doing shows. You actually told me, and I don't remember the exact percentages, but you told me that like 85% of the time, let's say that people spend at a trade show is meeting their appointments, going to the showrooms that they know they already like, or that they're already interested in, or whatever it may be. And like a super small portion of their time is spent finding new products and just stumbling upon them. So you have to gain, get their attention immediately as fast as you can, you need to get their intention. It's all about first impressions. And that super flat, wide, not super tall booth, if you will, was the biggest godsend for me in wholesale that I could have ever asked for. That and having that information from you, because the combination of those two taught me so much, which I can go into more later if you want. But um, but it just taught me so much. But that very first show, I picked up 30 new wholesale accounts. And yeah, I just thought I was on cloud nine. Again, I had nothing to compare it to, but I literally had crowds of people around my little wall. And I would, you know, I was so distracted by the crowds of people I had that I wasn't paying attention to anything else that was going on. But what I eventually realized because someone pointed out to me was I was so, all these people were like flocking to my booth, if you will. And I was just flabbergasted and I really didn't have that many items. I might've had like 20 SKUs 
that's it. And all these people were just flocking to my booth. And so that's when I was like, oh, this wholesale thing is something to really consider. It was kind of, again, it was kind of a hard thing to swallow to think that if I make a product for $5 and I sell it to them for 10, they're going to sell it for 20. So they're making $10 and I'm only making five. So as an artist, you kind of, you know, your pride can kind of want to get in the way a little bit. So that was a little bit hard for me to swallow at first. But then what I realized was again, like the royalties, there's no way I could own that many shops across the United States Mm -hmm. and be able to reach that many people with what it was that I love doing and get my name out there. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So so I was just grateful to have, to have that relate, those relationships, which, which evolved and has worked in my benefit over time, which again, I can go over that later, but you that's know, how it turned to wholesale. Would you show us some pieces of your art? Like just by sticking them right to the camera so we can see. Oh my gosh. That's hilarious. I had a fear that you were going to ask me that. Um, <laughs> I was going to show the ones I've got, but I was like, well, you know, you probably have got some things right there. No. Though. And I, of course I, I thought about pulling a few pieces in and all honestly, um, yeah, I'll have to get up and get the other one, but so one, like a thing that I'm, I don't know if you can see because of the lighting. Let's pick it there. way up there and see. Oh, well, hmm. There. Yeah, that's good. That's good. But yeah. A lot of what I do and that I'm known for, which that's a conversation in itself, are um, spiritual things and inspirational things. So this is one of my little angels. This is from two Christmases ago, actually, as one of my little angels. And you can tell there's like a lot of texture. I don't know if you can see that, but there's like a lot of texture. Every piece is hand painted. Um, But I mean, I do, I make, I mean, like I was just at a workshop uh, this past summer, actually in Colorado. And and this piece isn't actually totally finished. This isn't something that I would wholesale. This is kind of more of like my abstract pieces. But everything that I do, you can tell they kind of have a lot of like, meaning and um symbolism in it and honestly before I start anything even if we're making a huge batch mind you (laughs) over time it turned out that um I mean I think the most I ever made of any one piece was ornaments because we sell a ton of ornaments but I want to say that we had to make like 9,000 of this one ornament and we actually sold eight different ornaments that year but we had to set, we had to make like 9,000 of the same thing over and over and over again. Yeah. It was insane between like August until like December 15th, people are still like, please just ship it. It doesn't matter. We'll sell it after Christmas too. And blah, blah, blah. And so, um, yeah. And it, it, at the time, you know, there was a lot going on between the oil spill. And then also there was like a housing market crash in 2008. So when this all occurred was like, uh, I had, I had already been painting my angels and crosses and little hearts and flowers and all this stuff for, um, for probably, you know, like two years before, two and a half years before we moved here outside of even my licensing work. Um, but, um, so that was like in 2010 that we moved here. So the housing crash had happened and, um, you know, it's one of those things when, when tragedy occurs, there's kind of a, standard thing that we I don't know if this is southern thing or in general um but people either turn to Jesus or Budweiser one or the other usually unfortunately (laughs) unfortunately and I wasn't trying to capitalize on on selling uh religious or spiritual things it's just kind of it's just kind of what I don't know it's just what happened I can't I can't I can I don't know it's just what evolved it all happened organically for me and it I just kind of followed my gut with it so Oh, okay. So, um, so it's okay. So tell me, oh, I have so many questions about this. Like I want you to share one of those is I'd like you to, uh, so how does a person like you make 9,000 things that are one of a kinds? I mean, it seems like that makes sense going over to China and having them do it based on your design, but you actually sell things as you having done some part of it, but you're not doing all of it because you've got some helpers doing the things that are unnecessary, but less so about the image or tell me about, tell us about that. How do you do something like 9,000 of one thing? Well, okay. So, and then, and, and when we did that 9,000, that particular year, um, we sold, uh, 45,000 pieces of art went out of our warehouse. And, um, so that 9,000 was just a portion of that, but, um, We, yeah, so I obviously, I definitely can't do every one of them from start to finish, 
I am the owner. I am the only designer. And so I design everything, which again was a hard thing to swallow when I started with, when I started doing the wholesale. So that first show, I picked up 30 accounts. The next show I would jumped up to like picking up 45 accounts and I progressively got better and better booth spaces because because I was kind of a hot item, if you will. And so they would give me better and better booth spaces. Plus I had the money to pay for better booth spaces. So by, I think the fourth time I went to market, I was, I was up to like 140 wholesale accounts. Um, the most that I ever got to was like 450 wholesale accounts. And so, um, yeah, yeah, a lot. And not all of them order tons and tons. Like some of them might only order a thousand dollars worth in a year. And we always would zip code for text. So there wasn't anybody else in their zip code that had the item. So it kind of kept it a little bit more special. Well, so um, in order to do that, like I said, it was kind of a little bit of a hard thing to adjust to also as an artist is um, letting go of some of your process and being willing to delegate. And, um, but I obviously, I couldn't make them all myself. And I was extremely fortunate to have key people fall into my lap to help me with my business, particularly with pr the production side of things. And, and then additionally with like the administrative side of things, I had a lot of key people. And just side note, my dad has, all, I grew up with my dad being a carpenter and he's always been involved with the business with me. And so he would always go buy all the lumber. He would cut all the lumber. He drills a hole in the back so they can hang on the wall of every single piece. Well, so, so like he's, he's one person that would help me with things. I would, we would take raw lumber that he literally buys from the lumber store and I would have someone who was a prep person and they would do what needed to happen to that raw piece of lumber. So that no longer, I would come up with the steps and the procedures that needed to happen, but that person, I would train them on how I wanted it to look. And sometimes there's like a smoothness issue. I'm pretty type A, so it's gotta be pretty nice and clean. And I want it to look elegant and all that. So I was pretty particular about that. I would have to train that person. And then um, a, most of the time I had to do the more technical backgrounds. If it was just a solid color background, someone else could do that. Then my dad would end up cutting it and then someone else could paint the raw sides. And then um, I had uh, one lady who's helped me for years and she's like my second mom. And she would do all the palette knife work because the palette knife is really the hardest tool to wield that we use. But at one point, like that year that we sold 45,000 pieces of art, I actually had up to 15 people working for me. And um, yeah, and I, I, there were certain pieces and certain steps that only I could do because I was never able to train anybody else to do it the way that I liked it. But um, other than those pieces, those specific pieces, I mostly became quality control. And of course, I sign every single piece and almost every single piece I have to do something on in addition to just being the designer. But like I said, it was kind of a little bit difficult because I felt like a little bit like maybe I was selling out as an artist by letting other people make my stuff. But then I realized really quickly that, you know, Ralph Lauren doesn't make every single piece that goes out of his shop. Mm -hmm. In fact, he doesn't even design every single piece anymore. He might critique the designs or, you know, adjust the designs that his trusted designers make for him so that he puts his own personal stamp on it. But it still says Ralph Lauren. And it's like, you know, Ansel Adams got so much crap for like, you know, digitally adjusting his photographs and stuff like that. And it's like, you know, that was going to happen eventually. But back then it was like an atrocity that he would do that. And Peter Max, I guess, supposedly would have other people help him paint some of his stuff and then sign his big old Max on the painting. And it's like, oh God, I live in a small community with very, very well-known artists in our area and I was like, okay, I kind of need a pick. I either do this small wholesale gift art and be known across our country, or I'm really well known in our area. And I only paint large paintings that are, you know, between two and $20,000, but are only sold to very specific people. And so, yeah, I had to take on a group of people to help me with it all. I definitely don't make every single piece from start to finish, but I definitely design every piece. Now, when you went to the trade show, like how much did it cost you to have a booth there? Like the small one and then the big one, what was the difference in that? Okay. So when I first started out, um, they put me, which I highly recommend. I've had so many people ask me what, where they should go when they start out going to market. 
but there is a section in the temporary. So there, it's not a permanent showroom. So there's like permanent showrooms. I mean, Atlanta market is insane. If you ever go is one of the most overwhelming things. And you're just like, I cannot believe there's this much stuff in the world, <laughs> but it's so overwhelming, but it's also an experience that everybody should have, especially if they want to have anything to do with sales of any type of an object. But, um, uh, so when I started out, they have this section in the temporaries on this one specific uh, f building and floor that's called uh, emerging artists. And a lot of people, a lot of retail shop owners will go to that section because it's kind of the new thing. So on that same floor, there'll be like museum gifts and there will be like, um, you know, uh, uh, import gifts and so it'll be like you know people will bring stuff from mexico or people bring stuff from india or nepal and all these different places sell these beautiful things but they fall under that classification well if i'm a boutique owner and i don't ever think i want to sell anything from mexico why would i go to the you know mexico or imported from nepal or something why would i go to that section whereas if you open up an emerging artist it's a grab bag and you just, all you know about it as a boutique owner is it's something new because that section, you can only have a booth in twice oh and then you have to move to another section, whatever you're affiliated with. And so it really is the best section to go to. So part of the perk of emerging artists is they also give you a discount on your booth. I was so I would tell you, I need to write a book about how to do market because market, like they give you the best that they can as far as information, but it's such, it's such a cluster when you're there, especially the first couple of times when you're still learning. Oh my gosh. It's so, there's so much that you can accidentally do wrong that it's just crazy. But yeah, that first time. So the booth I think was originally supposed to be $3,000, but they, um, because I was an emerging artist and because I get a discount, I want to say it cost me like 17 or 1800 wow. then you have to pay for electric and you have to pay for lighting and you have to pay the porter to help you get in and out of get your product in and out of the building and you know because we didn't live in atlanta i also had to pay for a place to stay and you've got to you know there's there's a lot that goes with it it's more than just that 17 1800 mm -hmm. but that was how much the booth cost for me and um, from after that first one, I moved to another one and my square footage was a little bit bigger. So I want to say maybe I jumped up to like 2000 or 2200. Um, and then after that, I got into the better spots and over time progressively, which I could give you all the A's and B's to that. But what ended up uh, the last show that I did, I was in a juried section. So you have to submit your designs and you have to submit your photographs of your booth space and you have to submit all this stuff and you're on the kind of front row of things so people always walk the front row it's called the atrium there's food in there there's tables for people to sit and organize all the things they purchase so you you're more visible you're in a more visible location and the booth size that I had would run me nine thousand dollars just for the booth that didn't include my electric which obviously square footage increase and my electric needs increased um and, you know, like you once told me a long time ago, you need to get their attention immediately. And so I always made sure my booth was on point and beautiful, which all of that stuff costs money. But we, it was like, we did that twice a year. And those were our biggest, those were, that was how we generated the most of our money in a year mm -hmm. were those two shows. Yeah. Yeah, it's essential. It's really essential and also fun. I mean, it's really fun and intense and all that. There's there's almost no way around it. If you're going to be in an industry, you need to show up in that industry and present yourself in the best way possible. Yeah, yeah. And we had to, you know, the first couple of times that we went, I mean, I literally was like just handwriting all my little things and nothing had prices on it. And then you'd be like a bombarded with people asking you, how much is this? And what is this called? And I'm like trying to hurry and scribble scratch all this stuff. So by my second show, I had a very crude, but a, but an order form. And, um, you know, I would just staple their business card. There wasn't even a section for them to fill out, you know, to, and they, and I wasn't taking any money because I had no like payment system yet or anything. So I wouldn't make them pay me until I was ready to ship, which is a rat race to chase people down to get money from them. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, there I've, I've learned so much along the way, but you're right. If you want to go to a certain level, it is essential to go to some trade show and America's Mart in Atlanta 
is the most successful one. It's the busiest one for the type of thing that I was selling. Yeah. It's the busiest one. I mean, like I was invited to New York now and to the Dallas show and to the Vegas show. And I think there's a show in Idaho that I got information from that are all part of this like network. And um, I've heard, I heard time and time again that Atlanta was just always the best. And honestly, I kind of wanted to cap it at what we were doing anyway, because anything more would have gotten overwhelming. No doubt, because you really do have a, a limited capacity for how much you can actually produce, which oh, yeah. is awesome because it also makes it sort of exclusive and harder to get. Exactly. Okay, exactly. so I have a question. Um, I want to get to that in a second too, but what has been your, what do you think has been the biggest challenge for you in business? Um, I would say, so, so like, uh, so like letting go of, uh, letting go of some of the process and letting other people make my art was very difficult for me. Um, I'm not really good at, uh, necessarily at managing people, not, not like I can, I can manage people in telling them how to do, there was this standing joke in our warehouse that in production that I would always be like, Okay, so this is great, but next time what I want you to do is blah, blah, blah. I'm not one of these people that just goes, okay, I need you to do this because that's not working. Like, I'm just not that person. I'm more like, there's a little bit of fluff in there. So I'm like, okay, so everything looks awesome. I mean, I'm not like, nah, 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 nah. I'm not like that, but I am definitely like, I like to soften the blow a little bit. Like I want to, because it's hard for them. I can't tell you how many people have worked for me and they were deathly afraid. Like one of the very first steps that needed to be done, they were deathly afraid to screw up the art. And I'm like, number one, I would not give you anything that would, that I can't fix because I, I'm going to sign my name on every one of these. And so I'm not going to give you anything that I can't fix that I'm not comfortable giving you in the first place. And that is why you're doing the steps that I'm having you do, because there's still so many more steps that need to happen that I have the opportunity to fix it if I need to. Mm -hmm. And so it was really hard for people to, to take on some of those steps. And so I tried to be sensitive to that and, you know, soften the blow of, I'm not really keen on how you're doing this, but it's essential that I tell you that because if I don't, I'm going to have a hard time selling it. And so, um, so I have a hard time managing people that way. I think I had to let one person go because, um, it, it was very legitimate. I mean, like she, there was just issues that it, it was very legitimate, but it was so hard for me to do. Oh my gosh. I, I'm not good with that. Like I definitely should have at some point hired someone to be that person. So I wouldn't have to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, because that, that is a huge challenge for me. And then like, um, navigating the business side, which, which I'm capable of doing it. I used to be a bookkeeper for like a bike shop years ago. I mean, I'm capable of doing all that. I'm very organized when it comes to certain stuff, but really I'm drawn to designing. And if I have to choose one or the other, I'm going to choose design and paint every day over doing the business. So that, that kind of hurt me a little bit that I wasn't, um, I wasn't, uh, I, w I was challenged by it. And so I would just kind of, unfortunately, sometimes let it fall by the wayside, which isn't smart to do. Mm. And, um, that, that was a little bit difficult for me. Um, yeah. What about as a woman, do you feel like it seems to me like the art field is, you know, mostly it seems like it's easy for a woman to be in this, but have you ever experienced any challenges based on the fact that you're a woman? Okay. Well, so yes, I agree with you that you can, as a woman in the creative field, any, any art, um, you have a lot more opportunities than you do in other fields that obviously there's like uh, gender stigmas that go along with it. Like being an engineer, you typically think of or women. being in the snowboard industry. Yes. Or being in the snowboard industry. Oh, I will never forget one time I took my hat off and this boy turned around and went, dang, we've had a Betty riding with us this whole time. <laughs> I was like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Anyway, yeah. So, so in the creative field, though, there's definitely, you know, it's a, it's a much more, uh, I would say, probably female um, driven industry. However, that being said, um, it, okay, it drives me crazy sometimes, but I can't say anything because I could do it too. There's this thing that most men have, I always go back to like primitive society, we were berry gatherers, and they were lion killers. So like, I am flabbergasted by the fact that like, 
it's usually men. It's also women a lot of times. I'm not discounting that. So I'm totally generalizing. But so many men will just throw out these giant canvases that are amazing and slap $20,000 on it without even thinking twice about it. Whereas I would be like, oh, who's going to buy that? I mean, like, it's really, really and you like, I'm like slicing and dicing it. And they're just so bold to go and do it. It's like, it's like this innate thing that, that I would say more men probably have than women. So it's something that I have to overcome. Speaking of challenges is hmm. being comfortable with slapping my price tag on there because I'm like, I mean, men do it without even thinking twice about it sometimes. Do you know what I mean? And it, and it irks my nerves. It irks my nerves. The, but you know, like I said, I'm, I can make that choice. And so it's not their fault. It's my fault for not doing it too. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. Like, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so I would say that that is kind of a challenge and uh, with, with men in the same industry as me. And then another thing that kind of also it, it, every now and then my favorite thing in the world is to have a conversation with like, um, like some of our kids, um, the dads of their friends or like, the male teachers at school and stuff like that. And they'll be like, Oh, what do you do? I'm like, well, I'm an artist. I sell gift art. And they're like, Oh, that's cute. I mean, that's cool. That's really neat that that's right. That's cool that you're an artist and, and, you know, and you can make a living off of it or whatever, you, you know, it probably helps out a little bit, blah, blah. blah. And so it's cute. It's kind of cute. And it's like, Oh, that's so cute. Look at you go girl. You know what I mean? <laughs> and then for whatever odd reason, I would say like four or five times, they had to come to my warehouse for some reason and they're like oh this is great oh oh dang i mean like you there's a whole system here like you have a lot going on here and you have a system and there's saws and there's lots of people and there's boxes being picked up by fedex and all this kind of stuff and they're just like whoa that's really cool and so i always love i always think it's really neat when people are inspired when they see that kind of stuff but I, I, it was like priceless for me to see some, it's like, again, I'm generalizing. I don't mean that yeah. in, you know, in any way, anything, except that it's usually the men that it would caught them off guard. What exactly I do. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And so since you're asking me a specific question about being a woman and a, and a man, it does, it's that. a thing that slows me down. <laughs> like I said, I actually have an appreciation for it because they all of a sudden, I gain this new respect. Like I have this credibility all of a sudden when they see the process behind it, that I'm not just some, you know, little girl painting in a studio somewhere. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I can imagine it would be tempting. I mean, I would, I wonder when I think about how I would respond, what I have said, well, no, actually I sell a lot of art, not just a little art. I sell a lot of art every year. I might throw out a couple numbers. So I yeah. appreciate that you don't do that and you just yeah. wait to let them see. I mean, that says a lot about you. As oh yeah. Humble I would say, I would say probably uh, that I can count. I can remember twice um, because it, because you just have somebody who's just so arrogant and I don't even think it, in fact, oh my gosh, I know one of the times was not a man. I know for a fact, one of the times was a woman. Um, but sometimes when I'm trying to tell people and they just kind of have this air about them, like, oh, that's just so cute. And I'm like going, you know what? I chose over becoming a doctor to be an artist. And I chose to like, have children and be a stay-at-home mom for a period of time. And I chose to, these things were more important to me than the, you know, the, the credibility that you get because of having an MD behind your name, which is an amazing thing. And I mean, like, I, I love medicine still. Um, but it, it's like, you automatically have this credibility because you have this MD, but when people sit here, you're an artist, the immediate reaction is a starving artist. Like, that's just what they do. Yep. And it's, and it's so frustrating as the person that that's being assumed about, but I literally had one woman in my shop and, um, you know, she was just, she just had this air about her and I was so irritated with her. And at the time I hadn't, it, I hadn't hit that point where I sold 45,000 pieces, but I had at that point already sold 20,000 pieces in a year. And I had my little retail shop and she would come in there and I would hear her talking to her daughter about, oh, look, all she did was do it on a two by four. We need to try this when we get home. And she would so rarely buy anything. And her daughter sat there with her arms crossed in front of her after her mom was suggesting what they should make when they go home of my art. And she looked at me and she goes, you must make a lot of money doing all this stuff. And I was just like, oh, sister, <laughs> let me tell you what I have given up to make a lot of money. 
doing all this stuff. I'm like, you, are you kidding me? I'm a business owner. Like, I don't, I don't pay myself what I should be paid. I don't pay, like, you know what I mean? You just, and so, oh, it was so irritating. But yeah, I, that's when I started throwing out. I'm like, oh yeah, you know, I mean, we do sell to 200 shops across country and we shipped out 20,000 pieces of art last year. And, you know, but I was just like, don't give me that. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so that. Every now and then my weakness does come out where I just want to tell somebody to stop it. <laughs> I love that. You know, that's what makes you so remarkable because we do have this mis misinformation about, about artists not making money. Hey, I wanted to, so, so you're at a really interesting point in your life right now. This is like, it's almost like my question is going to be, what are some key moments when you've pivoted? But right now you're, you've, you did it when you closed your retail store, but it seems like right now you're pivoting in a new way. And I want you to tell about that because this to me is, is, is like reeling it in and opening your heart to what you really want for yourself. So talk about that. Okay. So, so yeah, when, um, I would say that the catalyst was definitely COVID, although I was thinking about it before. It puts a damper on my spirit because a lot of people will um, knock me off, if you will. Um, but but designing for incidentally designing when I design for the importer, uh, you, do you think if you think you're knocked off bad here in the United States by little individuals in tiny towns across America, they can't touch what the potential of being knocked off in a warehouse in China. And um, I had gotten wind actually that one of the warehouses that made one of our products sent photographs of my art to a very large crafting retailer in the United States, the buyer of that retailer, pictures of my picture frame saying, we can make these for you too. And, and sure enough, it took about eight years, believe it or not, but one of those retailers, they didn't have the same words that I put on my frames, but they had almost exactly the same font and the same look of my frames that I had done eight years before. And so what that taught me, though, was that I always have to stay ahead of the curve. I always had to stay ahead of the curve. They can have last year's designs because I'm not doing it anymore. And what I also found out was because I had so many layers, it's really, really hard to reproduce that. So mm -hmm. my easier things to reproduce were reproduced, but by other people and sold as if it was their designs uh, as an importer. Mm -hmm. um, but the more detail there is and the more the more exclusive items that you use or style that you use, the biggest thing is finding out your own style because that's really hard for people to replicate because it's yours. And so it's never going to look the same, mm -hmm. but it nevertheless, it still is very, um, it's daunting and it's a little bit soul crushing, but then you kind of have to do a little bit of self-reflection and realize why is this bothering me and what am I going to do with the information? Am I going to just keep driving forward with it and just keep designing and letting them have last year's designs and not stress about it? Or do I, like, is this really what I still want? And so what I started to realize was after going to market, like, I think, I think I had gone 18 times. It's exhausting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Market is exhausting. It's fabulous. It's fantastic. And I think everybody should experience it. But after 18 times, I was pretty tired of it anyway. Um, <clears throat> so I kind of, before COVID had already started to think that maybe I wasn't going to go back. And then COVID was kind of the catalyst for me. And what started happening was so many of our shops, because we sell across country, they were forced to close because their communities were closing down, their mayors were closing down retail, all this stuff. So all of a sudden in a season that isn't necessarily our strongest season anyway, which is spring, um, Christmas by far blows everything else away. Like we do probably two thirds of our business in a year during Christmas or for Christmas. And so spring isn't a solid time anyway. And then all of a sudden, the few people that would normally buy from us had no reason to because they had to close and so that was kind of a little bit of a jolt for me and then um various things happened to various employees that were going to make them not able to even help me anymore um and so I was like I really had to rethink this <laughs> I need to be receptive to some of the very blatant signs that I'm getting mm -hmm. that perhaps this isn't the best thing for me to do anymore um I was tired all the time and I was, my body was kind of breaking down because it's easy to not take care of yourself when you're busy like that, which is unfortunate. And you, everybody needs to keep that in mind. Um, and so anyway, what I'm doing now is uh, what I've realized in a lot of reflection. And every time I think I'm going to go back, there's like a huge roadblock that happens. It's the craziest thing, but anyway, um, so I'm clearly not supposed to be uh, going down that route anymore. 
but what I'm, uh, what I've realized is I have a lot of information and knowledge that I can share with people that can make their lives easier, whether it be if they are an artist that are considering wholesale, if they're considering open their own retail shop, if they're considering going online to sell stuff, or if they're considering to be a teacher, how do you go from like the way I designed when I was just going to make one item was very different than how I designed when we would make it in house. And so we would make anywhere between 150 to 2000 or higher of an item. And also is very different than how I designed for royalties because I'm not there to show them the products I used or how I did it. They have to figure it out. And so you have to design differently in hopes of the outcome you're looking for. <clears throat> well, so I feel like I have a lot of information that I can share with people, not to mention just my own design style, like how I do what I do and the products that I use and how I use those products. And so my new thing is going to be that I'm still going to do super minimal wholesale, but wholesale. I would love to sell more direct retail online because people get so much meaning out of what I do. The stories that I hear, I could never let go of because I mean, you know, trauma, joy, tragedy, just all this stuff. People find so much inspiration from the pieces that I sell. And so I don't want to give that up and not make that available for people. So I'll still do some retail online. And then I also want to teach as far as like giving people guidance, but also teach design styles and like a specific project that introduces people to new products that maybe they never considered using before. So it's kind of going to be a combination of a lot of things. I love this. And you know how they have those like wine and draw, like wine and paint things. And you know, you go in and you're all painting the same thing and you pick which of these designs we're going to paint. So when you think of all the different things that you have to paint, you could do a workshop specifically on all those different things. And then for a premium, sell that one piece that you painted on that show. I mean, oh, I yeah. think people would go crazy with that. They'd probably yeah, sell, yeah. like pay $250 just to get that piece that they saw you make with your own hands at, during that class that they took. Yes, no, that is very true. Because I, I haven't been able to do very many workshops but the workshops that I've done I've been very fortunate that the workshops that I have done have all been with like very highly regarded artists and um and so whenever they have a piece and they're willing to sell it at the end of the workshop that's exactly what happens is somebody pays a pretty print a pretty penny to get that piece which I wouldn't be so worried about the pretty penny it's more of just knowing that somebody wanted to walk away with that, which was my whole thing about saying, having your studio and your retail spot. Mm -hmm. it, it really engages the person and brings them even more meaning, especially if you stop and talk to them and you are, you know, willing to share and stuff like that. You get a little place in their heart that makes them want to take a piece of you home with them. Yeah. And so they're, they want to share. And then, I mean, I've had people write emails and reviews about that online all the time. That it's like, now that I've, was so nice of you to give me a call. And now that, I, now that I've talked to you personally, like I loved it before, I love it even more now after having talked to you because I can tell you're authentic and genuine and sincere. I love that so much. You know, there's a line in a, in a crash test dummy song that says, get to know the artist and get to know him personally. And that has always stuck with me because I, I feel like I don't, I only want art from people that I know oh, yeah. and even clothes. Like uh, the, my, my very favorite designers of all times I actually have met and I'm so honored. Like you, you'll That's pay cool. the money when you've actually made that connection with somebody. Oh yeah, totally. It makes such a big difference. I'm thinking of one designer that you and I both love. And when the day I got to meet her, I was just like blown away and I will never forget that encounter. And she was so so humble and so kind and that's like that's really cool that's really cool oh yeah yeah which we've got to go visit her because i need to meet her too oh, yeah oh yeah I'm <laughs> hey, in. hey so tell them tell me about what do you guys do about um sustainability do you guys have any sort of like steps you take or concerns you have about that or what do you think about that well for me with what i do like we don't what we produce doesn't produce a whole ton of like negatively impacting uh like byproducts by any means so like you know the, the byproduct that we have the most of is probably containers that product comes in mm. and most of the containers that the products come in I either need to bring back to the paint store anyway or I um we can recycle because it's plastic um and then actually I had one girl who who worked for me for a while they have a camper and she took all of our giant plastic gallon jugs 
and uh, drilled holes in them and put little Italian cafe lights, one in each jug and like strung them outside of their, their camper. So it would illuminate even more because they're white plastic. And so, you know, stuff like that. But like in general, um, we don't really have a bunch that like byproducts negatively impact anything. Um, and, and our art, it's on wood and people will either keep it forever, give it to a friend, give it to their kids or, you know, donate it, I guess. I don't know. I don't know exactly what they do. But um, one thing that we did do, and uh, I enjoyed doing this, and this was probably one of the last times that we did an enormous batch, is a um, friend of mine owns a lumber mill, a very large lumber mill in the South. And she's actually a huge advocate politically for um, restricting import of lumber because we don't know what their restrictions are in other countries. And we don't know what quality we're getting. We don't know what microbes are in that wood. We don't know what, you know, what is in that that is coming into our country, not even just the quality, but also introducing random species that we have no idea would impact our own lumber industry. And so she's a big advocate for that in the United States. And um, <clears throat> one of the last batches of wood that I bought, we went directly to her mill and picked up, you know, several, I forget what they call it. It's not a cord, but anyway, it's, it's a lot, a lot, a lot of wood. And, um, you know, I, I intentionally bought more than we needed knowing that we'll eventually use it anyway. And we stored it at our warehouse and we did get it at, you know, a less expensive price than if we went to like one of the big suppliers, but way more importantly, I was, I was wanting to buy us milled and harvested lumber because I know her ethical practices. Every time they clear an area, they're replanting constantly and she can give you all the ins and outs about how long it takes for a long leaf pine to grow to harvesting size. And so therefore, you know, how, so, so she creates a very, their whole lumber mill is very, very conscientious of sustainability. Nice. Yeah, it's really cool. Well, you're right. You can feel good about what you do because those, you know, the, the art you create is timeless. You know, when we talk about angels and crosses, anything that has to do with like Christmas and, you know, our standard visuals of Christmas, like that, I mean, that's the thing people have forever and then they pass it down. So it's not like you, someone's going to say, oh, I don't need this anymore and throw it out. They're going to give it to somebody because it's, you know, it's, it just, it's timeless. And that is something really cool about what your, you know, your work. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's not, I don't, I don't like follow trends. In fact, I can't tell you how many times, like I go to market and lo and behold, two of the colors I used happen to be the Pantone colors of the year. Like I, I didn't, I didn't even know that that was a thing that Pantone picks a color of the year and all that stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, and I can't tell you how many times that it happened where people were like, you picked the Pantone. I'm like, what? <laughs> and so it, you know, I don't, I don't, I honestly, because again, because so many people do knock me off. I am so conscientious to not be aware of what other people are doing that I'm doing this with my hands because I literally oftentimes go through life with blinders on because I don't want to go look up any direct competitors on Instagram or on Facebook or on all these other places because I would never want to be accused of having copied their ideas. Mm -hmm. And so, so I, I, I didn't know that there was a Pantone color of the year until I went to market and already had the two designs. They had just introduced it. How would I have known that before? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, so well, yeah. I had to worry about that with, with fashion. We had to stick with the colors so that people could um, merchandise together. So when you have a color that, that matches with everybody else's stuff, you can have them nicely arranged on a shelf or, you know, yeah. clothes hanging together and your, your like pants exactly match the pants that Lululemon produces. So it's right. way more important. And even in the, in the, in the housewares industry, there are yeah. some colors that are, that are popular. And that's one of the things we paid for every year because we felt like it's important, but it's also one of those things where oddly enough, our senses just lead us to those places too. Like they, you just naturally pick those colors. That's oh yeah. 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 I agree. Oh my gosh. Okay. So, um, what about, okay. So there's, I have three more questions. Um, so we talked a little bit about what's next for you, but right. So right now you don't have a physical retail space. Do you ever have warehouse sales or, or could come somebody come to your warehouse if they were there and buy direct from you if somebody wanted to do that? 
We have had people who, when I had my shop, a lot of people were so disappointed when I closed. It was, it was kind of one of those things that, um, I, I mean, I got some of the best compliments was when people would tell me that my shop reminded me of some of my very favorite shops. It would just be such a huge compliment to be put in that same class of like, you know, aesthetics and feelings and all of that. And so there were a lot of people that were very disappointed when I closed. And I still, in that little complex, hear from other business owners, people who have come in and would go in their shop and go, what happened to that precious little shop that was blah, 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 blah. And I closed almost two years ago. And so, um, <clears throat> yeah, that, that was a, that was a hard thing was not having the retail closing that retail. Um, and, uh, wait, say, uh, uh, say again, what like, did you... like, what's next for you? So you mentioned something about this teaching. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, I, you know, I, I would love to have retail again because it was so fun. It was so fun to meet the people and it was just so, it just was really a neat, neat thing, but it, <clears throat> it's a big commitment <clears throat> because you have to be there. And part of what made my shop, my shop was originally me being there all the time. And me, I always was the one that merchandised the shop. I mean, people would help me fill in, but it definitely had my style to it, my own, my own look to it. Um, and I miss that. I miss interacting with the people, but also at, you know, our, our, my, I'm, we're almost empty nesters and, um, we miss Colorado a ton. We love Florida, um, for most, most of the year, but we do miss Colorado a ton. And so, uh, you know, <laughs> I guess having that little nomadic gypsy blood inside of me when I, uh, when my husband and I were in the snowboard industry and being able to like travel a lot and just kind of just go and do and just enjoy yourself. Um, I, uh, we don't shy away from the idea of buying a really cool van and being able to just travel across the United States and go to some of the places that we feel like we haven't explored enough and go to some of the places that we loved exploring. We still love to mountain bike. We're fortunate because we do get to come out to Colorado at least like four times a year and spend a good bit of time there and uh, mountain bike and hike and visit old friends. And, you know, it's great. I mean, we still love that. So I definitely still will. I will always paint. I love the fact that as an artist, you can, you can, and now, especially with like social media, you can always do what you love doing as far as your creative, whatever your creative spirit is. Um, and so I always joked and said, like, an ideal for me would be like, I don't care if I'm 70 years old, riding my little bike with my little buggy behind me and my little easel and my plein air little setup and with my little puppy dog with me, because I do love dogs, like have my dog with me and just pedaling down to some piazza in Italy and just sit there and paint. And if people want to offer to buy some of my artwork, they can buy it. And if not, I just have a good collection of artwork. <laughs> And my little awesome. portfolio. So I do love the idea that I will be able to do that for my whole life, you know, as a creative person, you can. And so, mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. That's so good. Hey, so, so how often, so you're, so Ginger Me Designs is, is really about um, kind of gift art, but I also heard you say at one point, the idea of painting bigger canvases and bigger things and one of a kinds. And are you, is that something you're going to do a little bit more of, or what oh yeah. I, when, when I had my retail shop, I had a, a floor to be able to sell that on. Oh yeah. And you were saying about warehouse. Yes. Every now and then some of these people that were big patrons of my retail shop and were so sad when it closed would find out a phone number or an email or where our warehouse is. And all of a sudden we'd have somebody pop in and the next thing you know, they're buying artwork. Just like, I mean, it's, it's a shop. Like there's like carpentry happening and paint everywhere. <laughs> and I mean, it's not cute. It's fun and exciting and different. So it's intriguing, but somehow they'll end up buying, you know, a thousand dollars worth of gift art right there. And we just tell them to come back the next day and pick it up. And we'll even gift wrap it for them. Cause we do that when we ship retail anyway. And so we gift wrap it for them. But, um, but yeah, I, I, when I had my retail shop, I had a bigger like platform to be able to sell those larger one of a kind pieces. And, um, I did sell, I did sell some of those wholesale when we would go to market, they would, they would buy it and we would ship it from there to them. And they were just one of a kind and um, they would pick out specifically the ones they wanted. Um, yes, that is my goal is to do more of that. 
I also love to um, paint. Uh, I like to go from big to teeny tiny. And so, um, and somewhere in between. And so I've enjoyed painting recently a lot, especially when COVID started on paper and um, a lot of mixed media on paper. And so what's great is um, my one daughter is at school at SCAD right now. And she's really good with like technology and all that kind of stuff. So we're actually going to be opening up a website that we can sell prints. You can either get the digital file and print it yourself to save yourself some money, or you can actually buy the prints and we will, you know, get it printed professionally, roll it up and ship it to you. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll, we'll have that available also, um, which is going to be really fun because I love doing that kind of stuff. And, you know, you gotta, it's almost like um, making the most out of your time, like working more if, smarter, not harder yeah. that like, if I'm going to sit down and paint a painting on paper and be able to record myself. Now I have content that can either be, you know, on TikTok or on stories or in reels or whatever it may be. And, or I can sell it as a short video or a product idea, you know what I mean? Like show people the products and then show them a quick you know, video of me doing something and this is what you can do with it kind of a thing or break it down into the details and give specific instructions. So it's kind of like creating these opportunities for passive income, but it's still allowing people to, to improve themselves in some way or another or empower themselves in some way or another. And, um, but then of course I would have the original for sale, which yeah. like you were saying before, you know, I mean, like, like, you know, $95 for a paper, you know, you know, like five by seven, uh, multimedia abstract piece that, you know, took me two and a half, three hours to make, which is kind of a long time for a $95 piece of art. Mm -hmm. Um, or you can buy the print for $20, but this one's going to have, you know, my signature and it's the original. Oh, and by the way, all these 250 people watch me make it and you're the owner of it. Oh, right. Yeah. Wow. So that's neat. There's lots of streams of revenue and there's just everything you do has so many different purposes and reaches. That's cool. I'm trying. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, it sometimes takes the young people to like figure that oh. help us get those fingers out. Oh, uh, 100%. I can't say enough. Like for, for any, any, oh golly, you can totally tell why historically major movements always started at colleges usually, yeah. or, with, or at least with that generation, because I'm telling you, I, when I go visit our daughter, it's like, I come back and I'm like, so excited to just start something like I have this, like, it's just bubbling up inside of me. And it's like, they're set there. It's just, and even when she and her friend, I mean, you can tell in like the candor of my voice, I can hear that. I have goosebumps down my legs right now just even saying this because it's like, it's just so neat. It's so, it, my husband and I had so much fun at the age that she's at now. We just ate life up and we did some crazy, crazy stuff. And like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad my mom never knew what a 40 foot cornice was <laughs> because <laughs> she had no concept what I was doing when I was snowboarding, but it was so fun. And, um, but like, even when my daughter and her friends come to town here and we just cook and walk and play games like board games and go through the football or the Frisbee or the baseball out on the beach. And it's like, we eat up life again when that youth is around you. Like, it's just so effervescent. It's just so intoxicating. It's just, I just love it. And it, and it's so true. You're so right. Like it's, they're just not afraid to try to press buttons. And yeah. oh, I love that. I hate, I hate that you require that fear over life, over time in life. And it's, it's a battle to not let that overcome you. You know what I mean? Like you to yeah. just say, you know what? No, I can still do this. It's ridiculous to think I can't. Right. Okay. So this is the perfect time to talk about this. This is kind of our last question. Um, what Okay, so what advice do you give new entrepreneurs starting a business? Because the idea of pushing the buttons, like pushing play and getting people to say yes about something seems like a really good piece of advice. What else would you say? Well, um, yeah, I kind of actually um, jotted down a few things about that because I uh, that that is like so, that's what I was saying before that like I feel like I have so much information that I can share because it's so easy to make it so complex and it's so easy to not even know what questions to ask if you're brave enough to even ask the questions. Because I think that so many people think that with um, 
with uh, talking to someone who has an established business that they're never going to want that they would be insulted if you even would ask them some of those questions. And there might be some people out there who are insulted or would be like, I can't believe that they would even ask that. I don't know that I would ever say that unless you make a rude comment in my retail shop. But I mean, I don't think <laughs> I I don't think that if somebody who was trying to start a business um, asked me a question, if I would ever like dodge it or be insulted by that. Oh. Yes. Because I feel like, I feel like that's part of my purpose now. Like, I feel like if I didn't share that information, I'm actually doing a disservice to myself, but I'm doing a disservice to like that community as a whole, because, because they'll improve probably on whatever it is that I already kind of have mastered in the way that I could master it. But now it's time for someone else to take it to another level. But I definitely, um, I definitely would say this that um it's easy to get caught up in all of what we conjure up as our expectations for how things are supposed to be done or what we think is going to be the outcome so i would definitely say that like when i was in the throes of crazy amounts of production i wasn't as intuitive as i was when i wasn't that busy and so I've learned that when I start to get too wound up about something, and you know that feeling, you start to get too wound up about something, it's exactly the moment where it's counterintuitive, but I need to stop and sit down, calm down, either like let my mind go blank or be open, however you want to look at it, and just kind of reflect on what's going on and what my purpose was when I started it and where I want to take it. And then from there, just kind of, be willing to listen and don't look for affirmation of what you think would be the best thing because it's easy to fall into that trap. Like really listen about what, whoever you may want to call it, the universe, nature, mother earth, God, Buddha, whoever it may be, really be willing to listen to what you're supposed to do because we're all supposed to contribute something. And no matter how fearful it may be, or you may be of that thing, it's like, you'll be given the tools that you need and the strength and the courage that you need and the bravery that you need to be able to do what it is that you're supposed to do because it's what you're supposed to do. And so it's going to work some way or another. What you thought was your intention <laughs> maybe won't work. And then all of a sudden you realize that, oh my gosh, something better happened. Oh. And you know, so like, I highly recommend that people don't get caught up in all the this, that, and the other, and just slow down and listen to what their gut is telling them. And another thing is I've always told my kids, don't go into it for the money. The money's going to happen organically. You're going to, if you go into it for what you love doing and what you feel like you really, truly need to share with people, <clears throat> you're going to work hard at it because you're going to love doing it. You're going to sell it because you love what you're doing. You're going to like want to share it because you, again, you love this thing. It's so exciting for you. And what will happen is the money will come. It will happen. It will turn into a business. You need to be fair with yourself. And like, you definitely need to be aware of what you deserve to get, but be realistic about what that number is. If they're, if you're comparing your work to an established artist that's been painting for 20 years and in your area is charging $2,000 for a 24 inch by 24 inch canvas. It's really hard, but don't fall into the trap of thinking that you're going to get that same money. And so, because you're so new, they've been around forever. Just do it because you love it. Put a, find out what your goal is. If you're trying to get more people to know about you, then maybe in the beginning, you're not going to make the same money that you'll make in 10 years because so many more people know about you. But you have to kind of let that evolve naturally and do your best to like not compare yourself to these other people because they maybe have been doing it so much longer than you. Mm -hmm. So You know, one thing let I'm- it, Let it happen organically. Yeah, I love that. Hey, one of the things I think that's so, so incredible about you and your art is that you do, this is, so, I feel like this is so unusual. You make it accessible to people. And that is something that is really rare. You know, yeah. you a lot of things that are accessible because, you know, when, uh, you know, you know, my son is all about, you know, he's, he's an artist and, and he, his, his paintings sell for a lot and he has, doesn't have very many of them, you know, what he might've done a hundred 
paintings at this point and is selling them for lots of money. But in his mind, he knows that he needs to have something that sells to the masses so that everybody has access to his art, which is yeah. what you do. And that's so special. Well, I think because when I first started all of this, I, again, I wasn't in it. It wasn't for me, it wasn't about the money. Now, granted, I had the luxury of not having to, you know, be the breadwinner in our household. I definitely did have that luxury. But even if you do need to make the bills, you can totally do it. You just have to like go, go to festivals. You need to be creative with how you're going to do it. Go to festivals or sell prints instead of just originals, because it's important to have something for everyone, especially if part of what you're selling is yourself because they want to leave with something of you. They're so impressed with it. And if the cheapest thing that you have that they can buy is a hundred dollars, not everybody can buy a hundred dollar piece of art. But if you have some that's $20, they'll be thrilled to have it. Mm -hmm. They'll just be so excited. I one, I mean, I've given away art I've, I've to so many different people. One time I had this precious little girl in my shop and she was carrying around this piece of art and she was just so excited because she wanted to buy it for the people who took her to the beach. She was with a friend at the beach and she wanted to buy this little piece of art for the family that invited her to go with her all of her own accord. And so she came up with this little angel and it was $18. And she told me she didn't know if she had enough money. And I said, well, how much money do you had, have? And she had a $5 bill. And so I, I didn't want to just give it to her because this was really meaningful to this little girl. I could tell that this was something that she wanted to give to them from her heart. And so I backed out the taxes so that her little angel came out to $4 so she could still get some change. And I wrapped it for her like it was like a $150 piece of art in cellophane with raffia and all the scrunchie at the bottom and gave her a little tote bag so they couldn't see it yet until she was ready to give it to him. And oh my gosh, that little girl was on cloud nine. It just made her day. I mean, and I've done this long enough now that it's like I have people who were kids whose moms collected my art and now they're married and they're having their first baby and they want their own piece of art for their baby's bedroom oh. that like it's just really sweet. And so even just like brand new people starting out with their homes, you know, that can't afford the last thing you're going to do is buy art. You know, you need towels and a blender. <laughs> and so that they can come in and, and buy a little $20 piece of art for their brand new baby that they're so excited about to be able to afford that is like, it just means way more to me than selling it for $80. I don't, I don't care about that. Oh my gosh. Well, Ginger, I have appreciated you speaking today and being with us and sharing with our community. It's so good to see you and so good to have you share with us. Um, 